How the Philippines and Australia Secretly Planning to Defeat China The Philippines and Australia have a secret plan to beat China within 5 years. I've found some surprising details after doing thorough research, but the real question is, can they really win against China in a conventional war? Will America intervene? You might be wondering, Australia doesn't have military bases in the Philippines, so how can they assist in fighting China? Plus, they don't do any military exercises with the Philippine military, at least not recently. First, let's start with the basics. Why is Australia assisting the Philippines? And why are Australia and the Philippines such close allies? Did you know that Australia helped liberate the Philippines during World War II? Here's how it happened. The liberation of the Philippines started on October 20th, 1944, with the Lady Gulf landings. The naval invasion fleet at Lady included the Australian frigate HMAS. This was followed by ships delivering American troops that included the three Australian landing ships. Australian civilians at the Cloban had been interned by the Japanese after the fall of the Philippines in 1942. They were described as among the first prisoners of war and internees anywhere in the Pacific to be freed. Three Royal Australian Armed Forces units assisted in the Philippines. They also provided air support for the Americans. In their first landing, Australian aircraft carried out attacks against enemy supply lines. And then on November 22, 1944, Australian aircraft attacked targets for the first time. Australians continued to help the Philippines until the war finished. After the war, Australians were sent to the Philippines to support in the handling of prisoners of war returning from Japan on the way home to Australia. In total, 4,000 Australian service personnel took part in the campaign. At the aftermath of World War II, the Philippines made two memorial sites for Australians who sacrificed their lives to protect the country. In 2014, the Philippines honored 92 Australians at Palo Leyte, who paid the ultimate price of liberating the Philippines. The Royal Australian Navy also played a pivotal role in the largest naval battle at Surgao Strait and in the Battle of Lingian Gulf. Australia has been helping the Philippines modernize its military. For example, it donated a heavy lift Chinook helicopter to the Philippines on March 2023. It also donated two military landing aircrafts. Australia Philippine Military Drills or Exercises Approximately 1,200 Australian soldiers and 500 Filipino Marines took part in military exercises last year. 2,000 Australian and Philippine defense personnel, as well as American Marines, participated in amphibious landing and air assault drills as part of joint exercises also attended by the President of the Philippines. The joint drills come amid renewed tensions between Manila and Beijing in the South China Sea. Two advanced Australian F-35 fighter jets provided close air support, and Australian warships secured the surrounding waters. The air, sea, and land drills, the first large-scale joint exercise between Australia and the Philippines, simulated retaking an enemy-controlled island. Most of you don't know that the military exercises are meant to prepare for an actual war with China. Now, to fully understand why Australia is seriously interested in helping the Philippines, let's first look at the tensions between China and Australia. China's assertive foreign policy and the rapid modernization of its military has long unsettled Australian politicians. A turning point happened in 2017 when Australia banned foreign political donations, with officials warning of disturbing reports of Chinese attempts to influence the political process in Australia. The following year, Australia became the first country to ban Chinese tech giant Huawei from its 5G network. Another source of tensions has been Australia's participation in the Quad, an informal grouping that includes the United States, India, and Japan. But why was the Quad created in the first place? And why is China worried about the Quad? In the early 2000s, the United States focused heavily on Iraq and Afghanistan, 
which distracted them from significant changes in the Asia-Pacific region. China's growing economic strength challenged America's traditional role there. To counter China, the US aimed for a strategy called soft containment. This involves forming partnerships with nearby democracies. The US strengthened alliances with Japan, Australia, and India to carry out this policy. Another agreement was made involving the United States, Australia, and England. This pact allows Australia to obtain submarines with nuclear technology. As a response to the Quad and increasing tensions with Australia, China banned Australian import. Let's talk about the tensions between the Philippines and China. The tensions in the South China Sea started in 2012 when President Aquino ordered the Navy's biggest warship, Gregorio del Pilar, to help the PCG arrest Chinese fishermen who were allegedly capturing endangered giant clams. The deployment of the warship gave the Chinese the high moral ground as they claimed the Philippines militarized their dispute over Scarborough by sending a warship, apparently to boast that the Aquino government was exercising its sovereignty. Then Foreign Secretary Albert del Rosario released Philippine Navy photos intended to document its operations for internal use to the Philippine Daily Inquirer, which showed showing sailors with armalites guarding and camp Chinese fishermen were distributed globally. Del Rosario's move backfired. It triggered national outrage over the humiliation of the Chinese fishermen. China's social media were flooded by angry posts. Why does China a superpower allow a weak nation to bully it? In response, China maritime surveillance vessels and a flotilla of Chinese fishermen's boats rushed to the lagoon's mouth to prevent the Philippine vessels with the arrested Chinese from leaving. Thus, a standoff ensued when the Chinese and Philippine vessels refused to leave the lagoon, which risked violence breaking out between the vessels of the two countries. Nine weeks into the standoff, when Chinese and Philippine vessels refused to leave the lagoon, then U.S. State Assistant Secretary Kurt Campbell told Foreign Secretary Del Rosario that he had struck an agreement with the Chinese to leave the shawl. Simultaneous with Filipino vessels moving out, Del Rosario believed him and forthwith ordered the PCG ships to leave Scarborough Shawl, although Campbell tried to convince Chinese Foreign Minister Hu Ying to agree to his proposal. The latter, however, said this decision would have to be made by her bosses in Beijing. Even before Beijing could discuss the proposal, Campbell told the Rosario that the Chinese had already agreed to the plan. But why did the Americans fool the Aquino government, which ended the standoff? Obama's officials were worried that Aquino's military would deliberately or accidentally provoke an armed conflict with the Chinese. And in this case, the US would either have to militarily assist the Philippine vessels under their mutual defense treaty, which however could risk a nuclear war with China. The other scenario would be for the US to claim that the incident did not fall under the MDT since it had occurred in a disputed area. One important consideration for the Americans at that time was that President Barack Obama was running for re-election in a tight race, scheduled just four months away on November 14th, 2012. A war or even just the threat of war with China during the election campaign would have undoubtedly doomed his candidacy. In 2013, the Philippines filed a case against China to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The arbitration concerned the role of historic rights and the source of maritime entitlements in the South China Sea, the status of certain maritime features in the South China Sea, and the lawfulness of certain actions by China in the South China Sea that the Philippines alleged to be in violation of the convention. In 2016, the Philippines won the case. The UNCLOS clarified that China's claim over the South China Sea is invalid. The biggest blowback was that China embarked on one of the most expensive and massive land reclamation projects ever undertaken on the planet, spending an estimated $20 billion in a span of a year starting right after the Philippines filed its arbitration suit. China transformed its seven tiny reefs into the Spartleys, biggest and best fortified artificial islands. 
the Philippines pressure China through lawfare out of the reefs. So China retaliated by turning them into huge islands. That's a classic case of the sunk cost strategy in geopolitics. When the nation fortifies a disputed territory to make it costly for another nation to try seizing it. Another major blowback was during the Scarborough standoff in 2012. China stopped the Philippine banana and then all food exports on some excuse that some pests were found and therefore required additional inspections, leaving the fruit shipments to rot in the ports. Mindanao exporters lost billions of pesos in revenues that the jobs of over 200,000 workers were being threatened. The second Thomas Shaw, located just 40 kilometers east of the Chinese-controlled Mischief Reef, is about 200 kilometers from the Philippine island of Palawan and more than 1,000 kilometers from China's nearest major landmass of Hainan Island. The Philippine military stationed a handful of troops on the rusty warship known as Sierra Madre. The troops stationed on Sierra Madre depend on regular resupply missions to survive their remote assignment. But Manila says China's Coast Guard routinely attempts to disrupt those operations. It also says that Chinese vessels regularly block or shadow Philippine ships patrolling the waters. The number of reported confrontations with China appears on the rise this year, with the Philippine accusing a Chinese ship of carrying out dangerous maneuvers against one of its vessels near the second Thomas Shaw. Manila also alleged that the Chinese Coast Guard directed a military-grade laser at another ship, causing temporary blindness to its crew. A leading military expert says there is a 60% chance Australia will be drawn into a devastating war between America and China over Taiwan or the Philippines in the South China Sea within five years. Australia has been building its military capabilities that are designed expressly to contribute to American operations to defeat China. Australia plans to host up to six US B-52 bombers in the Northern Territory. US bombers operating from Australia could be assigned to strike China's nuclear infrastructure. In the event of war, the Australian submarines would probably be assigned to sink Chinese naval ships and submarines, blockade ports or strike targets in China with cruise missiles. The following is a hypothetical scenario of how Australia will aid in the Philippines in the event of war with China. In 2027, and with little warning, China declares the start of an operation to restore the integrity of Greater China. Quickly, the PLA takes control of all of Taiwan's offshore islands. Taipei's electric and communication grids have been shut down by a combination of cyber and kinetic strikes. Taiwan's air force and air defenses have been neutralized. The Taiwan government is in hiding, most likely dispersed in hardened facilities. Its ability to command and control its forces is impaired and communication with the outside world is limited. The global economy, equity markets, and capital flows all take major hits. With swift ballistic and cruise missile attacks, the PLA neutralizes the US 5th Air Force in Japan, destroying most of US Air Force aircraft on the ground and heavily damaging airfield and support infrastructure. US naval facilities in Japan have been attacked and heavily damaged. 7th Fleet ships in these ports have been sunk or heavily damaged. Initial Chinese attacks do not directly target the US military bases in the Philippines, but attacks on US forces based in the Philippines generate collateral damage on US forces and kill civilians. The Philippines initially declares a defense emergency and consults with the United States and Australia on next steps. In the face of peace demonstrations in major cities, the government of the Philippines invokes the defense clauses of the security treaty with the United States. Japan and the Philippines are in the fight. Tensions are high on the Korean Peninsula. Militaries on both sides of the DMZ are on full alert. The PLA has embarked on an all-out assault 
on America and the Philippines. Attacks include communications and GPS jamming, kinetic attacks on the US and Allied command, control, and communications infrastructure in the region, and attacks on low Earth orbit imagery satellite using high energy lasers and jammers. Many protesters demand their countries stay out of the war. China attacks US military facilities in the Philippines with a series of long range cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and cyber attacks. Moderate to severe damage has been sustained. Direct combat has been underway between China and the US forces for a month. As is the historical norm in great power wars, it's increasingly evident that this war will last years rather than months or weeks. Likewise, neither side was fully prepared for the sudden scope and scale of the conflict. Finally, the world intervened to put an end to the war and prevent escalation into a nuclear war. Is there a possibility for a war to happen between Australia, the US, and the Philippines?